Hello, everyone, and good evening, and welcome to the Cooper Union. On behalf of the Cooper Union and the Cooper Climate Coalition, I would like to thank everyone for tuning in from their respective locations and joining us for our special event this evening. Cooper Union Climate Week 2020 is a series of lectures and events addressing our shared future through the lens of global Green New Deals, environmental racism, and community action. We aim to promote curiosity, interdisciplinary dialogue, and sustained engagement with the climate crisis. My name is Simon Garb. I'm a student at the Cooper Union School of Art, and I'll be moderating this evening's event. Today, I am sitting on stolen land. From where I am, I'll be enjoying this program on unceded Menominee, Winnebago, and Oneida territories. We pay lip service to the indigenous people of these United States of America, knowing that we have mountains to move in reconciling violent white crimes committed against them. And as the plot of climate change thickens, we fall at the feet of indigenous people, desperate for their presence, their knowledge, and their mercy. Tonight, we are joined by Michael Wang, Jillian Schaefer, and Nick Lutzko. Michael Wang is an artist based in New York. His practice uses systems that operate at a global scale as media for art, addressing climate change, species distribution, resource allocation, and the global economy. Wang's work was the subject of solo exhibitions at LMCC's Art Center at Governors Island, New York, curated by the Swiss Institute in 2019, and at the Prada Foundation in Milan, Italy in 2017. And it was included in Manifesto 12 in Palermo, Italy in 2018, and the 20th Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism in Valparaiso, Chile in 2017. In 2017, he was a recipient of the Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors Grant. Nick Lutzko is an assistant professor of climate science at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. Nick's research combines theory, numerical modeling, and observations to one, understand the changing circulation of Earth's atmosphere, and two, study the climate system holistically in order to better predict how it will respond to rising CO2 concentrations. Nick is also interested in climate issues more broadly, including climate model development and evaluation, climate variability, and climate policy. Nick holds a doctorate from Princeton University, and prior to joining Scripps, worked as a postdoctoral associate at MIT. Jillian Schaefer is a founding partner of SL Collective and faculty at UCLA Architecture and Urban Design, where she has taught the impacts of climate change risk and new technologies on cities, space, and visual media. Jillian holds a Master's of Architecture from Princeton University with a certificate in media and modernity and graduated with a Bachelor of Architecture from the Pratt Institute. Jillian has previously worked at architecture offices in Berlin, Tokyo, New York City, and Boston. Her work has been exhibited in the Venice Biennale Fundamentals in 2014, the Seoul International Biennale on Architecture and Urbanism in 2017, and several galleries in New York. This evening's event will focus on how the intersection of our speakers' professional practices in tandem with other disciplines will be crucial in rendering a livable and just future. Our panelists will be presenting on their individual practices, followed by a discussion of their work. Then we will take a few questions from the audience joining us live on YouTube via the chat. The Cooper Climate Coalition is dedicated to providing a harassment-free experience for everyone. Please note, no hate speech or offensive language of any kind will be tolerated during the program, including comments in the chat. If you have any viewing issues, please email us at climate@cooper.edu. I'd like to welcome our guests and thank them for being with us. Michael Wang, Jillian Schaefer, and Nick Lutzko. Welcome and thank you for being with us this evening. With that, I'll pass it to Nick. Oh, well, thanks for the introduction, Simon. Um, and thanks a lot for the invitation to, to participate in this event. Uh, I've been looking forward to it uh, for a while and um, I really love and, and support the work that you guys are doing at the Cooper uh, Climate Coalition. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, so I thought I'd start us off by laying a foundation for the discussion tonight um, by talking about uh, sort of from a scientific perspective, some of what we know about past climate change and the climate change that we expect to see in the future. And this will really be based on the data that we observe, uh, climate models and proxies. So to start off with, uh, this is a graph of uh, global mean, the anomalous global mean surface temperature over the last 140 years. And if there's one thing we know about climate change, it's that uh, surface temperatures have been warming up. Um, since 1900, uh, they've warmed up uh, in the global mean by say somewhere between one to 1.5 degrees Celsius. But you can also see that there's a lot of variability in the, the rate of warming. So for example, there was a warming hiatus from about 1940, 1940 to 1960, 
which was due in part to aerosols, so little particles in the atmosphere which uh, reflect solar radiation and act, actually act to cool the Earth, and also due to natural variability. Um, there's also, it's also been argued that there was a hiatus in warming in the early 2000s, so between about 2000 and uh, 2015, um, but we're pretty clearly out of that now, um, and we're setting warming records every year. Looking into the future, it's impossible to, for us to predict exactly how much warming we'll see over the next century, but we can make projections for how much warming we'll see under different emission scenarios. So for example, under a business as usual scenario in which you don't really make any effort to reduce emissions, um, you can see from the shaded uh, orange region here that we should expect somewhere between three to five degrees of warming by 2100. On the other hand, uh, with very strong mitigation, it, we may be able to keep the warming under two degrees. Um, though I would argue that the IPCC's RCP 2.6 scenario, which is shown here in, in the kind of bluish purple, is actually quite unrealistic. Um, so for example, it assumes that a large fraction of the land on Earth is used to draw down CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, but you know, we could use this land to do other things like grow food. These projections of future warming are based on climate model simulations. Um, these are, uh, I think, really remarkably complex um, uh, software programs. They run on some of the largest supercomputers on Earth. And the simulations involve, uh, say, on the order of 10 to the 15 calculations per second. The way that they work is they divide the globe up into grid boxes um, with a horizontal extent of about 10 to 50 kilometers in each direction. Um, and we do this for the, both the atmosphere and the ocean. And the models are able to simulate the flow of the winds and the currents in the ocean, chemistry, land use changes, um, sea ice, et cetera. Um, the models at this point really have a, a, a strong degree of granularity to the predictions that they can make. The idea of a climate and a weather model was actually first dreamed up in 1922 by the Irish mathematician Lewis Richardson. Um, in what he called a forecast factory. So this was before we had computers. Um, and so he imagined this sort of giant spherical building uh, in which again, the globe was divided up into different boxes. But now instead of having a computer solve the equations for each grid box, there's a person sitting at a desk solving these equations by hand. Then in the center of the sphere, there's this sort of giant podium on which a, a central controller sits who gathers the data together to make the forecasts and makes things, does things like make sure that one region of the earth doesn't speed up ahead of the, uh, the rest. Um, Richardson actually got to try this out for, uh, in a small, in a uh, miniature way for, uh, by making predictions for the UK um, in 1923. And these were actually a failure, the forecasts were inaccurate, but we know now that um, he actually had the right equations. Uh, he just didn't have the right input data uh, for his calculations. Moving on, um, you know, I started off talking about global mean surface temperature, um, but the pattern of warming is also um, something that's a lot of, of a lot of interest, and it's also something that we know quite well. So here I'm showing um, projected temperature change, changes by 2090 under either this uh, strong emission scenario on the top or uh, the business as usual scenario on the bottom. You can see that there's very different global mean warmings, so we have a lot more warming under RCP 8.5, but the patterns are pretty similar. For example, the largest warming is at high latitudes, uh, specifically in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, which is a, something we call a polar or Arctic amplification of warming. You can also see that the land warms more than the oceans, uh, which is partly due to land's lower heat capacity, but it's also because the air above the land uh, is generally drier than the air above the oceans. Finally, you might notice there's a warming hole in the North Atlantic, uh, just off the south coast of Greenland. Um, this is the region of the Earth which uh, warms up uh, the slowest. And actually, um, it was the subject of the, the Day After Tomorrow movie, which came out like 15 years ago now, I think. Um, and the premise of that movie is that this warming hole would somehow expand um, to cover the whole northern hemisphere and lead to a, a kind of ice age. This was something people were worried about, uh, again, like 20 years ago or so, but it's been pretty thoroughly debunked at this stage. Another way of visualizing climate change that I wanted to mention is um, through the ocean. 90% of the 
of the excess heat from increased greenhouse gas concentrations is taken up by the oceans. And actually only 10% goes to um, heating up the surface and the atmosphere. And we now have um, about 50 years of data on the ocean heat content, on how much heat is in the oceans. And we can see that there's a pretty strong linear trend, just like there is um, with uh, surface temperatures. Along with this, we see rises, rising sea level um, because warm water expands, and so the sea level rises, and uh, decreasing Arctic sea ice extent um, because these, again, the warming is concentrated at high latitudes, so the, the waters there are warming up uh, quite quickly. Uh, we're also, this is unrelated to the oceans directly, but we're also seeing um, reductions in glacier mass balance, which is contributing to the sea level rise. Now, it's plausible that um, just under, because of internal variability, we could see the kind of warming of surface temperatures that we've observed over the last 100 years. Um, but it's basically impossible for both the surface temperatures to warm up and for the oceans to be warming up uh, at the rate that they have without um, some external forcing like greenhouse gases. And so uh, I like to think of the ocean warming as a kind of smoking gun of climate change. You know, it's really the, the um, the strongest piece of evidence we have of the human's influence on the climate system. Okay, so I've been talking about climate change over the past 100 years and projecting out into the um, next 100 years, um, but we can actually recreate uh, uh, climactic conditions going quite far into the past. So this is a graph of um, uh, reconstructions of global mean surface temperature anomalies going back 2000 years. Um, you can see there's a lot of variability here from about uh, 1,000 to uh, 12,000 CE, there's a period called the medieval warm period. And then from about 1400 to um, 16 to 1700, uh, there was a little ice age. During this time, the Flemish painter Bruegel was painting these scenes of village life in Flanders, where you can see there's a lot of snow on the ground and um, people are ice skating on rivers. And uh, I grew up in Brussels, and I can tell you we never had um, snow like this on the ground, and we certainly never went ice skating. Um, and you, this uh, change in the climate happened for only a, a difference of 0 0.5 degrees Celsius in the global mean. So I think this illustrates how, at a regional scale, climate change can be um, a lot more drastic than it is uh, even on a global scale. The way that we, re we reconstruct these past climates is using what are called proxies. So things that we can um, uh, measure in the lab or observe, uh, which tell us something about uh, past climate states. So for example, trees tend to grow faster uh, in warmer years than they do in cooler years. And so we can use tree rings to um, reconstruct temperatures going back um, maybe 500 uh, or even up to 1,000 years in the past. To look further back, we can go back almost a million years uh, using ice cores. So um, ice cores trap air bubbles in them, which record um, information about the state of the atmosphere uh, when the ice formed. Um, so we can reconstruct temperatures and CO2 concentrations going back um, close to a million years. And uh, here we see the oscillations of the glacial and interglacial periods. So this cycle of ice ages and then uh, more temperate periods, um, which uh, uh, we were in uh, over the past um, maybe 800,000 years. To look even further back, um, we can use sediment cores. So creatures which live in the ocean, um, when they die, they fall to the ocean floor and their, their shells uh, get turned into rocks, but um, their shells also record information about climactic conditions in the past. So we can actually, I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty in this, but we can actually re reconstruct CO2 concentrations going back, um, you know, 400 million years here. And uh, if you look at this graph for a moment, you'll see um, under a kind of moderate, uh, even under a kind of moderate um, mitigation scenario, by the end of the uh, 21st century, we're probably going to be looking at a climate state that the Earth hasn't seen for 20 or maybe 50 million years. And if we don't do anything to uh, cut CO2 emissions, uh, we're going to be in a climate state that the Earth hasn't seen for hundreds of millions of years. Finally, um, I want to indulge just to tell you a little bit about the kind of work that I do. Um, so I spend a lot of time thinking about clouds. Clouds are one of the largest uncertainties, or they are the largest uncertainty in uh, our predictions of future warming. Just small changes in the amount of cloud cover uh, could lead to large changes in global mean surface temperature and to local temperatures as well. 
In particular, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty around marine stratocumulus clouds. Um, low clouds, which look something like this, that form on the eastern part of subtropical ocean basins. So here off the coast of California, uh, the coast of Peru, Namibia, and Australia. There's a lot of uncertainty around how these clouds will respond to warming. Um, and they could, be, they could act as a large uh, positive feedback on warming if we see um, um, significant reductions in stratocumulus clouds. The other part of my work, um, as Simon said, is on atmospheric dynamics. So trying to understand how the atmosphere does things like transporting heat from the equator to the pole and how atmospheric jets work. And uh, to do this, I use a lot of idealized climate models. And so um, I just want to share these simulations of um, a mid-latitude jet uh, which try to explore the role of moisture in governing these jet dynamics. Okay, with that, um, I think I'm going to hand it off to Michael. Hi, uh, thank you, um, Cooper Climate Coalition, for hosting these events. Um, I'm going to talk about four works that emerge at the intersection of human and natural systems and to pretty explicitly address um, processes behind climate change. Um, I'm gonna share that. Uh, the first work I'm going to talk about is a series called Carbon Copies. Um, this is a work uh, I started a long time ago, um, eight or nine years ago. Um, and the, the carbon copies were um, visualizations, these small models um, that represented the carbon emissions of contemporary artworks. Um, and so I selected initially maybe about 20 artworks um, and found different stories behind their production um, or their display, their fabrication, um, where I could find a kind of calculation um, that could tell me what were the carbon uh, emissions that were the result of the creation of an artwork. Um, and for me, these stories, as I started to kind of um, uncover these stories, um, they told a kind of a, a really different, they give a really different value to these artworks. Um, this the footprints of the artworks for me were almost like this kind of invisible shadow version of the work um, that somehow in the atmosphere there was this invisible footprint produced every time an artwork was created um, and i tended to focus on these more recent so the calculations felt a little bit more accurate but also um, larger scale works um, typically larger scale works um, where there was something kind of impressive about um, the, the figure, but they were really variable. So just a couple examples of what one was. This was Jan Bo's We the People. Um, and here I calculated the carbon emissions uh, for the production of that work based on the copper, the 31 tons of copper used to fabricate that work. Um, the copies aren't exactly, they're an interpretation of the work. So here um, I, I modeled it almost as like a kind of cube and there are all these sorts of cubes because I was making the models um, so that the volume of each model kind of represented the volume of carbon dioxide released in the creation of the work. Um, and every, every story was different. This is a, was my calculation for Vanessa B. Cross VB64 from 2009. Um, and here it was a performance piece, but as part of that performance, Kanye West flew in to New York from Paris Fashion Week for three hours to produce the, the film for that work, so that provided for me the kind of um, the kind of story for which I could find a calculation around the carbon emissions from that flight. Um, so here, the model represents uh, that quantity of CO two released from that that flight, which is twenty two about twenty two tons CO two. After creating these kind of maquettes, these sort of visualizations of those footprints, um, I worked with a carbon offset company. Um, to purchase 
offsets to then offset those works. So actually these works were for sale and still have been sold by commercial galleries, but instead of um, kind of appropriating that system of the commercial gallery to sell these works in exchange for carbon offsets so that the kind of price for each work is matched to the, um, the price to, to offset the original work. Um, so it kind of creates this almost like shadow version of uh, a kind of gallery of a kind of like uh, an art world almost, um, but envisioning it in terms of carbon emissions. Um, and for me, I think what was important about this work was to kind of create this whole system so that I could think about making an intervention in the atmosphere as kind of a key kind of, almost like a new medium saying, I wanted to work in the air, um, but that's something that's so invisible and, um, and quite in a way abstract, but I wanted to tie it back to something um, that had a really high level of visibility like these artworks. Um, and kind of to show that every artwork is already a kind of climate work. Um, that this, um, these footprints are sort of there, even if we don't see them. Um, so there was first this kind of making visible of what was invisible of the kind of CO2 shadow of each of these works. But then for me as an artist coming in and saying, what I want to be able to do is to make that gesture of erasure, um, the offset of those footprints. To me, that was the important gesture. And it kind of opened up uh, a new way of working for me of saying that actually I really want to work directly with these kinds of natural processes, um, that that's something for me that can become a kind of medium um, as an artist, something I can work with directly. Um, this is a work that's actually quite recent, but engages still with like a lot of these same processes. Uh, it's a series of works called The Drowned World, um, which takes its title from a J.G. Ballard novella uh, that imagines um, a kind of future of climate change in which the polar ice caps have melted, um, the seas have um, covered the earth, um, but in, in so doing that the earth kind of reverts back to this um, Paleozoic state um, when the earth was a warmer place. And he was writing about this before sort of understanding um, climate change as we understand it today. So he envisioned that this happens as the sun enlarges. Um, but I wanted to kind of update that um, the concepts in that novella to today when we understand um, that climate change um, is a kind of something that we're actually in the midst of. Um, but at the same time, even though we understand that, I think that some of the kind of deep time kind of biological and geologic processes that undergird this process that we're kind of experience in a certain way every day are were somehow less visible. Um, and so part of this uh, project was to go back and look at, um, I, I chose coal as an example, to look at what are the kind of organic origins of fossil fuels um, and to make that visible, not just to understand um, the kind of the kind of history of, of fossil fuels. Um, these, these are photographs of um, Carboniferous era flora that have left their impressions either directly in coal or in sediments that are uh, were found alongside coal deposits. This is a, a kind of lost species of plant called the Lepidodendron. Um, but I also wanted to think about how to connect our experience today to that distant past, this 300 million year old past. And the kind of the idea in this novella, The Drowned World, that somehow in a warmer world, the past returns felt like something that I could imagine almost as a kind of, um, with a slight degree of science fiction, I could imagine happening in response to climate change as we understand it today. Um, and so this is a work um, where I wanted to actually recreate a living version of a carboniferous forest. So the kind of plants that I was finding in these fossils, I found their closest living relatives um, and created this kind of living forest that approximated what a carboniferous forest could have looked like. Um, so these are all plants that existed before the evolution of flowering plants, things like ferns and cycads, um, araucarias. Um, these were the kind of plants that I used to create this living forest. Um, and it was installed within the ruins of a coal gas plant. Um, so the site itself was the kind of site where coal formed from the remains of these ancient forests 
was turned into air, it was vaporized and turned into gas. Um, so at this very site of this sort of now disused plant, I'm imagining that those forests emerge again. And part of the, the kind of speculation around this was envisioning that as these forests, these distant ancient forests are burned, that atmosphere is now kind of being restored. The atmosphere that nurtured these forests is being restored through climate change and maybe allowing these forests now to kind of re-emerge. This was a piece I showed alongside that. I just wanted to really kind of zoom in on the um, biological processes that are kind of behind these very fundamental processes that are related to climate change. Um, and one of those processes is photosynthesis. Um, and so this is a pool that I've seeded with um, cyanobacteria, which would have been the very first organisms that use chlorophyll to um, create atmospheric oxygen. Um, and so in a way, this was kind of the first green on earth. Um, and I wanted to kind of just put that green on display, but actually the green that is created by these living organisms, the cyanobacteria. Uh, I think what's interesting also about cyanobacteria is potentially um, when they first emerged and created atmospheric oxygen for the first time in Earth's history, there was also a massive extinction event. Um, maybe the the biggest extinction event ever in the history of the planet. Um, and to me, there's just an interesting parallel about an organism, um, here cyanobacteria, but also thinking about humans today, that a living organism could actually be responsible for these massive changes to the atmosphere with these kind of disastrous consequences. But of course, we exist today only because of this atmosphere was formed by cyanobacteria and then uh, and then terrestrial plants and other kinds of organisms that use photosynthesis. Uh, and this is a video that shows the, the previous installation, the forest. You're kind of rising up through it so you can see the forest in relationship to this industrial site, this coal gas plant where it's installed. And Cooper Climate shared on their Instagram um, a video that I put together um, really recently um, that actually takes some of that footage and some of the documentation of that work and puts it more explicitly into this kind of deep time context, kind of embeds it in envisioning the whole history of Earth's atmosphere. Um, you can see it on uh, on the Cooper Climate Instagram, and it's also on, on my website, which is uh, michaelwang.info. Um, this is a, an, another ongoing work, Extinct in the Wild. Um, for this um, series of projects, series of installations, um, I'm looking at species that are classified as being no longer extant in nature, um, but they're not extinct. They persist in under human culture. So in cultivation, in captivity, um, in all kinds of ways. In uh, there are plants that are a part of the ornamental uh, plant trade. There are fish that are kept by the pet trade um, but are no longer found in the wild. Um, there look like a huge number of species that fall into this category for all kinds of different reasons. They're in some way have been deemed useful or valuable to humans or can live alongside humans in some way even as the environments in which they've evolved have changed or they've been extirpated from those environments, almost always also because of some kinds of human actions. Um, and in these installations, I've collected these species and brought them into art spaces uh, where the staff of these art institutions then become trained to care for these species. Um, this in the back here is a, a species called Brigamia insignis, um, which is a Hawaiian species that used to grow in the cliffs of Kauai, um, but its pollinator 
likely went extinct. And so it now only exists when it's pollinated by hand. Uh, this is a species called the red-tailed black shark, um, which is very common in the pet trade, um, but it's extinct in Thailand, which is its native environment. The pale leucistic axolotls, um, the axolotls only ever been known from the canals of Lake Xochimilco in Mexico City. Um, and what's interesting is they, they've been several times, no one's been able to find them there, but then they'll return. But for me, even these canals, they're Aztec canals, and they're in some way uh, a human artifact. Um, and so in trying to find somehow this line between what is nature and what is human culture, um, I felt like they still fell into this category of something that only exists in this kind of um, human world. Uh, and there's been a few different versions of this. this I included this because it's, it's, it's near Cooper. This is the roof of the Swiss Institute on St. Mark's Place. And here I did a small version of this, uh, of an extinct in the wild kind of, it becomes a roof garden. Um, these are all plant species that are considered extinct in the wild. Um, so ginkgo, which are very common in urban plantings, but are not found growing wild. They're always found in an association with human habitations. And it's probably because their seeds were dispersed by some extinct large mammal or um, even a dinosaur um, that is no longer, it no longer disperses their seeds and they're only being dispersed by people. Um, often they're planted at cemeteries or at temples because they have religious significance and they probably have been for thousands of years. This is a species also at that roof garden, Franklinia alatamaha, named after Benjamin Franklin. It's only known from a really small area in what's now the state of Georgia. Um, but with the introduction of certain funguses with cotton cultivation, that small population disappeared, but it's been grown in gardens um, ever since. Also as part of this project, I'm making these kind of pilgrimages to locations where a species was last known in the wild. Um, and so this is where I went to a location that seems based on genetic analysis to be the last place where ginkgo grew wild. There's the highest degree of ginkgo diversity here among cultivated ginkgo. Um, it's in the Dalo Mountains, uh, just outside of Chongqing in China. And then I'm also documenting these species in their kind of new human environments. Um, so this is a ginkgo planted in Chengdu as part of a new development. Uh, this is the last place where Brigamia insignis, this uh, Hawaiian species that I mentioned earlier in the exhibition, this is the last place where it was known to live wild. Um, and it's no longer found here. But I also visited a nursery in the Netherlands where it's being artificially propagated in the thousands. Um, as part of the kind of houseplant trade. Uh, and this is the Tizian Tisco Pass in Morocco. And this was the last location where the Barbary lion, which is the North African subspecies of lion, um, were the last, there was the last record of a, of a Barbary lion being shot here. And now this is where the, the road is cut through the mountains. Um, but there's a very small population in Rabat at the, at the zoo that traces back to these royal collections of lions that were, have ancestors in the North African Barbary lions. And so it's, they likely carry on some of the lineage of that, that lost lion species. And the last project I'm going to talk about is Extinct in New York. And this takes some of the themes from Extinct in the Wild, but looks really specifically at New York as a context. Um, and so here I was looking at species that are known historically from New York City, um, but that no longer grow wild in New York City. Um, and I think what's so interesting about these stories is they tell the story of kind of the impact of urbanization. Um, but the story of New York is also very much a story about industrialization, about the violence of colonization, about capitalism, and all of these forces have an impact on the kind of living kind of natural heritage of this area. So the, the disappearance of these species 
is often linked to those changes, the impacts of those forces on the city. Um, so it started with research um, in herbaria. These are a series of watercolors based on the last known collected specimens of the particular species from one of the five boroughs of New York. Um, this is uh, Brasenia shreberi, uh, also called water shield. Um, and then I went to the locations where these last collected specimens were found. So this was collected at Silver Lake in Staten Island. And so I documented what these locations look like today. Um, and sometimes they look still kind of wild. They're often parks because those are the locations where something might have persisted for a long time. Um, and sometimes they look very changed. Like you can understand why this species wouldn't be found there anymore. This is Helianthus angustifolius, the swamp sunflower. Um, and it was last collected on New York Avenue in Brooklyn. It was last collected there in 1908. This is Epigaea repens, uh, the trailing arbutus. It was last collected in Prince's Bay in Staten Island. A lot of these species were last collected in Staten Island, I think for a couple of reasons. I think one, there were just a lot of green spaces that remained in Staten Island, but two, there were actually a lot of botanists who lived in Staten Island historically. Uh, so there might've been also a kind of collection bias that these plant specimens were being taken from Staten Island more than from other boroughs. This is Clematis ochreluca, curly heads, also known last from Staten Island from these serpentine cliffs in, in Grant City. And this is Capnoides sempervirens, the pink corridalis. And it was actually last collected, grow, found growing in the botanical garden in Bronx Park. Um, and this is a, a drawing based on the last specimen of Zostera marina eelgrass uh, and this was last collected in Jamaica Bay in 1883. After doing this research and kind of coming up with this list of around 50 species that are no longer found in New York um, but that exist in this kind of as historical evidence in their bearing specimens, um, I started growing uh, my studio just north of the city um, a lot of these species from seed and seedlings and I was kind of documenting them as they came into flower or came into seed. So this is sort of that process of, of growing these lost species um, that still live elsewhere, but no longer live in New York. Uh, and then for this exhibition last year at Governor's Island, I kind of brought these species back. So I brought 46 species um, known from New York City, but no longer found wild to these um, greenhouses that where they're displayed temporarily for about a month indoors. I think part of part of this project was it's kind of a, a, a document of loss, but I think it was also for me a way of thinking about how could this city change to actually become a kind of incubator for life and kind of allow the return of these species. This is a kind of lichen called Usnia angulata, and it's just really amazing for me to think about that apparently these kinds of macro lichens would grow from these old growth hemlocks that are in Manhattan, you know, long before there were Europeans in Manhattan. Um, but that somehow the environment has changed, not only because these lichens are very sensitive to air quality and when coal started being used as a fuel, they kind of quickly disappeared, but they also require these really high levels of humidity. And apparently there used to be these mists that would come through kind of coastal morning mists that would come through the city that no longer do, and, and no one knows exactly why, but the lichenologist who kind of helped me uncover the story thinks that even just the presence of these lichens and forests themselves would have held in moisture in a different way. And uh, this is Sargassum philippendula, something called gulfweed. And there were a lot of maybe hundreds of kinds of um, seaweeds in New York Harbor, uh, but with the opening of the Croton Aqueduct, Suddenly there was so much more wastewater coursing through the city. Fresh water was kind of hard to come by before that point, but once the reservoir opened, it meant all the water has been used for so many other purposes and also being kind of flushed away and flushed into the bay and carrying with it all kinds of nitrogen and, and pollutants. Um, and it really just changed um, the chemistry of New York Harbor and a lot of these seaweed disappeared at that time. These are just some images of the plants living temporarily in this very artificial environment. 
So I, re I really saw it kind of as like almost like this life support system for these species that no longer can live in the city. But at the end of the exhibition, um, these plants were outplanted at different existing uh, parks and gardens um, in, in New York City. So in a way they have been returned, but they are being cared for by city gardeners now. Um, so still they only exist in this sort of very kind of um, artificial relationship with, with human caretakers. That's it. With that, we'll pass it to Jillian. Thank you for the great presentations, Michael and Nick, and also the kind introduction, Simon. Uh, thank you to the coalition for the invitation to present. I also really love what you're doing at Cooper Union on the topic of climate. It's unfortunate that we can't all come together to have these conversations in person. Uh, my name is Jillian and I lead a practice here um, based in Los Angeles. Uh, today, I'm gonna to share a project with you, which is in development in the Salton Sea area of California. This is a project we're working on right now in collaboration with another climate scientist and professor at Scripps. And also Nick has been a consultant on the design. One of the things that makes this project important to me is that the Salton Sea is uh, one of the areas which will be most devastated by climate change. And these effects are already becoming visible, exasperating social inequity in this region. I wanna begin with this quote uh, from the editors of Climates, uh, Architecture in the Planetary Imaginary, which is an anthology that Columbia GSAP published in 2016. Our conception of things like air, ocean, rock, ice, and weather condition our engagement with them. This could mean many things for the field of architecture, perhaps most central is the recognition that our environment is not just a resource to be managed, or an externality to which we must adapt, but one of the chief figurations of shared or contested cultural values. I like this quote because it highlights that architecture's role is not to passively respond to climate change in the sense of changing how we build. Green, which we also hear in architecture, is often a blanket statement for building standards like LEED certification. Uh, but that architecture can also stand as a vehicle for visualizing climate change and engaging with topics that are in direct relationship with climate. Natural media, air, ocean, rock, and the material I'll be exploring tonight, dust, uh, bring materiality to some of these values ascribed to climate as they force us to think about what architecture is and does. Uh, from this jumping off point, I've been interested in dust. Dust is both ubiquitous and often goes unnoticed, but it has a huge impact on climate and on society. Uh, famously, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein during the year without a summer in 1816, which was caused uh, by the volcanic ash from the eruption of Tambora. Um, we can see dust from space. Dust also has a connotation of uprooting and moving populations as we saw in the dust bowl. Its pervasiveness can be associated with ideas of revolution, protest, migration, as the dust rolls in, and so on. At a finer scale, you can dust for fingerprints, uh, but also the verb to dust implies the maintenance and energy that goes into getting rid of dust, uh, like dust mites, hair, and dead skin. And lastly, um, a lot of dust going into the atmosphere uh, um, is from arid deserts coming from fossil fuels, or sorry, not fossil fuels, from fossils creating a link between the present state of the atmosphere, the weather, and the distant past, giving another illustration from the phrase to dust to dust. Dust is the medium by which the atmosphere gains materiality. This is a satellite image showing the vast quantity of dust that blows off of sub Sahara Africa. Over 100 million tons per year passes over the Atlantic where it fertilizes the Amazon rainforest in Brazil, um, seeds hurricanes and sinks to the ocean floor where nutrients are provided uh, for phytoplankton. These images illustrate the scales of dust from the microscopic composition to the global scale of its transport. Uh, where does dust come from? Well. Most of it originates from shrinking lakes all over the world and therefore the direct connection to climate change. 
Uh, although it's called a sea, the Salton Sea is a lake. Um, most of the dust which blows across the Atlantic from shrinking Lake Chad, uh, but there are many examples of lakes which have shrunk during the 20th century, uh, leading to more dust in the atmosphere. Uh, on the bottom right in California, Owens Lake, although it's uh, quite a different scale from the Salton Sea, uh, it has been studied as the example of how we expect the Salton Sea to change in the next decades. And of course, uh, desertification has enormous consequences for humans as local communities are turned into climate refugees or suffer from increasingly severe famine and conflict over scarce resources. Um, in Yemen, civil war and global warming are combining to create some of the worst famine on earth today. Uh, returning to the Salton Sea, in the past few decades, it has already experienced substantial reductions in area. On the topic of water politics, it used to be that surrounding counties, um, such as Los Angeles and San Diego, diverted resources to maintain the sea and sustain local ecosystems, industries, and population. But as the water became scarcer, this was no longer feasible, which has led to a rapid shrinking of the Salton Sea. For those of you who don't know, uh, the Salton Sea is also the first body of water which many migrants encounter after crossing the border. And this is also a reason why there are settlements around the sea. Uh, but in fact, in the 1960s and 1970s, the Salton Sea was a major tourist destination and it attracted more visitors per year than Yosemite National Park. Uh, the culture at this time was quite similar to its neighbor, Palm Springs, uh, but tourism rapidly disappeared as local ecosystems collapsed. Um, so today the Salton Sea is home to many communities which face a dilemma of worsening dust conditions while not being able to physically move from the climate affected region. Um, while many inhabitants dream of leaving, the widespread issues around respiratory health mean that uh, those with the ability to leave feel an obligation to stay and take care of their families. And 20% uh, of children in this area are born with asthma. Uh, so there have been a number of strategies identified for suppressing dust, such as weighted gravel and nets to uh, stop the transport of dust. Uh, the shrinking of the sea is leading to rapid increases in dust admissions. So under normal conditions, the sea keeps the basin cool, uh, which generally stops winds from flowing over the topography and kicking up dust. During a dust storm, when cold air blows over the topography, it is able to blow over the basin and kicks up dust. So uh, in the future, as the lake shrinks uh, and it doesn't cool the basin as much, winds will be able to penetrate uh, into the basin more easily, leading to a constant dust storm state. This is an image of the newly exposed lake bed or playa, which is the prime source of dust emissions in the future. Um, the changing meteor meteorological and dust conditions are the subject of scientific investigation. And so the brief was to construct a, a research base that fit into these dust storm conditions while also uh, serving as a community and educational space. This is a picture of the site. It's next to a series of citrus orchards and the land to the east is free land on which uh, UCSD has already installed some scientific equipment and a small weather station. Uh, importantly, the reason this is cited here is the presence of an internet tower and access to utilities like electricity. To the northeast uh, are the views to the Salton Sea and this massing uh, is the design for the building. Here's the existing instrument and weather station which takes periodic measurements of the changing dust levels in the atmosphere and relays the data back to scientist Amato Evan and his team. Um, he goes to the site during these dust storm conditions. So uh, given that dust is a topic for research, we started by studying the prevailing wind directions, both during dust storms and secondary winds during uh, quiet conditions. And our key finding here was that dust storms mainly occur from winds that blow from west to east or southwest to northeast. 
So um, we organized the building into three programmatic bars, one for research, one for education and community, and the third as a dormitory uh, and shelter space for Amato's team. So these three bars uh, overlap and orient to prevailing wind directions. They create programmatic overlaps, which hybridize and inform one another of mixed interactions. Uh, together, they form the building envelope, which is then sealed by a dust membrane or outer skin. And lastly, the bars are calibrated to curated views of the sea and also uh, of the dust that accumulates along the windows of the research space. The purpose uh, of this dust that passes through the membrane and accumulates on the windows of the research space is the creation of a stratigraphy. Uh, just as rocks form in layers representing changing environmental conditions, uh, the dust that accumulates creates a record of the changing climatological conditions. So as new parts of the lake bed are exposed, the properties of the dust, such as color and size of grain change, and so do the layers. Here you see the climatological layers or stratigraphy forming around the windows of the research space, which has been calibrated to the wind direction. The stratigraphy acts as both uh, scientific data and a visual illustration of the impacts of climate change on the Salton Sea. Uh, in other words, the accumulation formed acts as a didactic tool for those who encounter it uh, to see the timescales of environmental change. So with the development of the stratigraphy in mind, uh, the massing is organized through live simulations using butterfly of the pressure and velocity of these winds in order to extract surfaces that would accumulate dust over time. So purple here represents low pressure and yellow represents high pressure. You can also see eddies spiraling in the kinks formed by the bars uh, and the, the circling of eddies traps dust into these corners. In the plan, you can see uh, the three programmatic bars overlap, uh, the research space with two stratigraphies created on both sides, the community classroom, which cuts views back from the stratigraphy onto the west, uh, which is visually linked to the sweeping views of the Salton Sea to the east. Since the research team only visits the site during extreme dust storm conditions, the project serves as an educational and community center as well. Uh, K through 12 school children can use the space for after school activities and uh, the dormitory space uh, makes it possible for campouts. So it also becomes a space for educational groups to travel uh, to with the interest of learning more about climate research and climate change in the Salton Sea, since it becomes a hub for plotting data uh, that is sent back to the university. This is a view of the community classroom linking together the visible shrinking of the Salton Sea and the data along the windows of the research space. Uh, together, this material and conceptual infrastructure renders climate legible, knowable, and actionable when choosing materials and interior finishes We've also considered the scale of the body and all of the politics that are embedded within it. So um, in this case, salt has been used for dehumidifying properties uh, as an agent for curing respiratory problems. Uh, we've done some thinking around how salt might be used as an interior finish in the form of a salt brick in the dormitory space. Um, materials perform not only for their visual qualities or their structural integrity, um, but for their atmospheric effects. The research, or sorry, the entrance is covered by an awning to keep the dust out and punches a hole through the net. Standing uh, from the wall near the scientific equipment, looking back through the research space and community classroom, there are views out to the sea. Uh, the research space is embedded further into the landscape in order to submerge further down for dust collection, but also to prevent uh, dust from blowing out along the sides. Um, scientist Sarah Ahrens uses a similar technique to the net, but at a much finer scale with marbles in order to collect dust for her experiments. Looking from the exterior, a subtle stratigraphy forms along the west-facing facade. 
in 2025, the building provides shade and shelter. It functions as a dust storm observatory and creates an infrastructure uh, which provides scientists with new results. 100 years later in 2125, the building creates a record to be studied about the accelerated changes in the region and accumulates dust onto its walls until it's buried. So ultimately the stratigraphy speaks to the act of uh, scientific data collection and to the didactic purpose of the building in visualizing climate change, uh, but also to the inevitable aspect of ruin. Um, people will only live in the Salton Sea for so long, but the research base will eventually transform from inhabitation to observational use. Uh, so this project is kind of at the intersection of multiple time scales, the time scale of the human for which they might observe this change, uh, the time scale on which a building falls out of use, um, the climatological scale in which regional weather changes and the geological scale on which all of this is recorded through the medium of dust. Just to finish, I'd like to thank my great team, uh, Chinmay Suri, Florian Lepinard, and Ruchi Singhania, who have stuck with this project while working remotely. And also thank you to Alden Studios. Thank you everyone very much. We have a couple questions from the chat. Um, and then if you will, I'd like to finish out with one closing question. Um, so this question comes from Christopher Crew. Christopher Chu, excuse me. Jillian, how do you imagine the research center gets built, its impact to the site in which it sits disrupts initially? Yeah, uh, well, so the project right now is in some grant funding and also uh, funding is being matched uh, by scripts, but we're still raising funds to complete the project. And uh, what I've really been doing is kind of finding collaboration with communities around the Salton Sea, like local governments and the school system in order to actualize uh, the project. And like I do view this as, I guess, kind of a form of activism because climate change is not universal, but we need to take into account uh, some of the wider narratives of climate change. So um, because climate change is so accelerated in the Salton Sea uh, and the impacts are kind of enormous, um, yeah, it's important for these communities to, um, yeah, have voices to be heard. Then we have a question for Nick, um, which I believe will lead him into a brief discussion um, from Sam. He says, hi, Nick, I'm hoping you could elaborate a bit on clouds and climate. Is the concern that as they disappear, we'll lose their shade and the planet will heat up even more than predicted? Uh, yeah, that's exactly it. So um, clouds have a huge impact on Earth's radiation budget. And um, a lot of the uncertainty around future warming comes from whether there will be an increase in cloud cover or a decrease in cloud cover. Um, it's now been pretty firmly established that there will be a reduction in cloud cover. Um, so there's less reflected solar radiation, more reaches the surface and the surface warms up. Um, but how much exactly of that will happen, we don't know. Um, what people are really worried about is that um, with enough warming, uh, we could get like a sudden um, collapse of the clouds. Eventually, essentially, they all evaporate off. And then we could be looking at uh, warmings above 10 degrees um, from the current climate. Um, yeah, were we going to go into the, the group Q&A now or? Yeah, okay. So um, yeah, I guess uh, we wanted to end a little bit by talking across the different works. And um, I wanted to start off the conversation by um, asking Michael and Jillian, it seemed in both of your works, there was this interest in timelines. So Michael, you're thinking about the life cycle of how organic matter gets turned into fossil fuel. Um, you're thinking about um, the periods on which these um, species are, are extinct or extinct in the wild. And then Jillian, you're thinking across, you know, the time scales of the building, of the climate, of, of, on geological time scales. So uh, what drew both of you guys to these themes of uh, time scales? And, and why, do you, why did you think that this was a good way to explore the theme of climate and art and architecture. Maybe Michael, if you could go first. 
Sure. I mean, I guess for me, it's sort of unavoidable um, that when I'm look when I'm looking at things like origins of um, fossil fuels, it it just it takes you back millions and millions of years. And I think uh, what's so interesting to me is how those time scales get kind of compressed and elongated in these really interesting ways that we've been burning uh, coal for you know at a, at a large scale for maybe 300 years, um, but it took 300 million years for those deposits to form and kind of come into the present. So there's this weird kind of uh, intersection of like almost these human time scales and then these vast geological time scales. And I think in a, a lot of my work, I'm trying to kind of bridge those uh, different um, time scales, but also the, the intersection of these very different kinds of systems too. Um, and so I, I guess the, as a kind of, as a, as an artist and as a you know kind of tethered to human a human time scale i still want to try to encounter and find my place that's already kind of within that much long, longer period of time yeah i think it's interesting that you bring up human time scale uh, because clim climate change is in a scale that is immediately apparent to the human time scale and i i guess in my work what i've been thinking about is, well, for one, the time scale is kind of inherent in the site. Uh, it's one of the few times in which you can compress uh, a building and collapse a climatological scale into it. Um, and I've also been thinking about, uh, I guess, an artwork from Robert Smithson, uh, The Partially Buried Woodshed, I don't know if you know it, um, where, well, I guess it was built out of organic material. And the idea was that it could decompose over time and it would be covered, uh, a berm would form, and then new species would grow over top of it. Um, and it's been interesting to me because it kind of speaks to this process of entropy. And uh, I guess I also see a connection with your work, Michael, because through these vast time scales, uh, like things are lost, species in the atmosphere are, al are alterated because they've been curated by humans. It's interesting. Entropy is a pretty controversial topic in, in uh, climate science, actually. Um, people try to describe it, try to use it as there's some kind of uh, organizing principle to the climate system, but no one's really done that successfully. Um, another uh, thing that I want to talk about, and uh, Michael and I talked about this uh, in our Art in America piece, is sort of what the purpose of these visualizations uh, is. So for me, when I'm looking at data or, or um, model output, uh, you know, this is sort of acting as a metaphor for the climate changes that we're experiencing or that we're seeing in the future. Whereas um, uh, Michael and Jillian, both your work is more uh, didactic. Uh, maybe I would say you're working in metonymy um, uh, it, and um, rather than a metaphor. So, you know, again, is this a choice which you made? Is this something which you feel is just the best way for art and architecture to engage with climate? Um, is there room for both metaphor and uh, sort of didacticism? Um, you know, what do you think? Maybe Jillian, you go first this time. Yeah, um, through this project, I guess I've been thinking a lot about building as a form of representation. So I guess building as a representation of climate change and I think ultimately what matters is uh, like what you do with these uh, visualizations. So in this case with the stratigraphy, um, it kind of depends on who's observing the stratigraphy. So if it's just a matter of, I guess, the public can, coming to see the change, then uh, it's just another eco-literacy project that I think a lot of art has done. Um, but by thinking about the stratigraphy as something that's given over to scientists and more specifically to um, geochemists, then there is kind of a, a larger role in that and how we predict uh, other areas and how they might trend towards climate change in the future. So um, yeah, I've been kind of thinking of the didactic tool of visualization um, or of the dust as a way of how it can be part of uh, I guess, like uncovering other narratives to climate change. I guess for me, something like climate change is so kind of like heterogeneous and diverse, but also so abstract um, that it 
kind of requires metaphor to make that intelligible in a certain way. But at the same time, I'm very interested in finding those kind of material points of um, the way that we might experience something like climate change in a very direct way, in a very kind of embodied way. Um, I think some of my interest in that uh, kind of experience comes maybe from performance art, um, where um, a, in one kind of articulation of performance art, a performer really embodies um, an action. Um, it's not just a representation of that action, it both is the action and its representation. Um, and I think I kind of aspire to that in a lot of my work saying, you know, even when I use tools of representation, like the carbon copies, it's still linked to something that is more uh, material embodied, and, um, um, which is that uh, process of offsetting this um, carbon footprint in the atmosphere. They somehow I need that to be a real kind of one-to-one -one intervention. Um, and I think part of that for me is a kind of uh, a way of turning to other kinds of representation, like um, as you're mentioning, metonymy, synecdoche, how does the part represent the whole, this part that we're all engaged with, that we're all are a part of these systems. Um, I think once we have a better sense of our role within something as all encompassing as a matrix or a system, we also realize that our actions have an impact and we are a part of it. And there's no kind of separating out representation from the represented or from reality. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a really great answer, both of them. Um, and it kind of lead me on to the, I guess, maybe the last question, um, which was, uh, you know, one of the, I guess, the pleasures of working um, with Jillian on the Salt and Sea Project and doing the Art in America piece with Michael for me is, you know, working interdisciplinary, working across disciplines. Um, it's a way for me of, of sort of bringing the science out of uh, the ivory tower and of talking about climate to different communities. Um, so what does working, um, what does interdisciplinary work mean for both of you? Um, do you feel that it, you know, Michael, I assume you're working with scientists as well. Um, you know, does it, do you feel like it expands your practice or does it um, um, change or reinforce the message that you're trying to, to, to broadcast? Yeah, I mean, I guess part of the reason I call my work art is because I don't really know what to call it. And that's uh, really like that's a, fair kind of a big kind of open category. Um, and it's just necessarily interdisciplinary. And I, I feel like, I think obviously there's a reason that disciplines arose and created all kinds of specialized bodies of knowledge, but I also think that they're very li limited and especially in confronting something as um, kind of all encompassing as climate change. I mean, how, there's no discipline that can begin to understand that um, in its entirety. Um, and so I kind of just pick and choose tools from different disciplines as they become almost necessary. And sometimes that means collaborating with, with scientists um, collaborating with people from all kinds of disciplines. Um, sometimes, for example, with um, the Carbon Copies Project that's intersecting with um, finance, um, all these other kinds of uh, systems as well. So I'm looking for kind of pulling from all of these and kind of integrating them and synthesizing them to use them in new ways. Um, and also to kind of expand the tool set available to artistic practice, um, that these all have a kind of aesthetic or representational kind of valence to them. Yeah, there, I find there's something almost anthropological about your work, actually. Um, even even with the um, the drowned world, it's sort of like you're recreating this this um, environment because you want to be like out in the wild studying it or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think part of the part of the sort of the need to sort of work with the things themselves, to work with living plants with species, not just representations, is to have that direct encounter, um, and that there's something more meaningful about being kind of with another being than simply seeing one kind of reduction of it, uh, whether it's a visual representation or, or whatever it is, that somehow that's not the thing itself in its kind of a full richness. Yeah. Um, yeah and so Jillian, I guess architecture sort of by its nature seems to be kind of interdisciplinary sort of engineering and art and stuff. So yeah, I guess, could you talk about that a bit? Yeah, definitely. Well, I think kind of in the same way, borrowing from different disciplines. But I guess in this project, like quite literally, scientists have become the client. So in a way, it's like, how do scientific, how does scientific research translate into the way that architecture is conceptualized? And um, yeah, like just borrowing data from these fields and ways that scientists are already working to do their research. Um, so can uh, material 
processes in collecting data be used at a larger scale for architecture in order to prototype some of these building technologies. And I kind of see architecture fitting in in that way. Hmm. Are scientists good clients, you would say? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh -huh. I have a question for you, Nick. So you talk about uncertainty and projections and in clouds. Uh, could you talk more about this, uh, what they mean, what is uncertain, and how should we be thinking about them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I, I think uncertainty is kind of a difficult um, subject for climate scientists. Um, there's a kind of tension between wanting to sort of give clear messages to um, policymakers and to the public uh, with the kind of scientific need to be cautious and to put error bars on things. Um, you know, so, you know, there's, there is definitely uncertainty about how much warming even under a given emission scenario will have. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, it's very clear, there's no question that earth is warming up and will continue to warm up. You know, it's more a question of whether it's gonna be bad or very bad uh, rather than, um, you know, whether there will be warming or not. Um, I think as a community, we've probably done a bad job at, um, of, uh, of talking about these different kinds of uncertainty. And, um, uh, you know, there's still plenty of climate skeptics. So I, I do also think, um, or I'm encouraged by, you know, the Cooper Union Climate Coalition, um, Extinction Rebellion, these kinds of groups where I feel like there's a little bit of a sea change and, and that people are moving towards um, really broad recognition of the scale of the climate problem. Um, so even if we haven't done a great job of it, it seems like to some extent the problem is resolving itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we're wrapping up now. We have one more as our final question. We have a final question from the audience before we wrap up and that's scientists often think of global climate change and local land use change as separate problems. They're intermingled, they're intermingled in Jillian and Michael's work. Do you think this distinction matters at all? I'm sorry, could you say it, uh, say it one more time? Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course. Okay, so, scient so scientists um, often think of global climate change and local land use change um, as separate issues. Um, they are intermingled um, in Jillian and Michael's work. Um, do you think the distinction between climate change and local change in, in land use is, does it matter? Is it significant? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to answer that um, maybe in a roundabout way. Um, for example, when I was looking at the changes that happened over the course of 200, 300 years to New York City, you can, some changes are more global. There are sort of some recent changes in the kind of um, biodiversity of New York that are linked to these global changes like, like climate change. Um, but there are so many more that are linked to really kind of specific um, changes to the city. Um, and part of that has to do with a different kind of um, human relationships to the um, other species that are also a part of the city. So when the, Manhattan and New York was Lenape land, um, there was actually probably a greater number of species at that time than there would have been if there were not people um, man actively managing um, that land. Um, and that has to do with all kinds of practices around um, cultivation, around kind of the management of forests um, and all of the kinds of particular uh, flora that were being cultivated kind of intentionally um, in Manhattan and, and New York more generally. Um, so I think that's a really, a really interesting example about how the relationship between humans and other species can be um, productive in a way or mutually beneficial, I guess, um, which is a, um, one of the themes that is a, a big part of both Extinct in New York and Extinct in the Wild, imagining what could those relationships be of kind of sustaining one another um, in a mutually beneficial way. Um, and of course, so much of that has changed um, with you know, those, those um, traditional land practices are no longer a part of the way that uh, the city is kind of, the relationship between humans and non-humans in New York City today. Um, but there are also all kinds of other 
um, relationships that now are a part of the city. There are, there are probably actually more species in plant species, which is what I was focusing on that project in New York City today than maybe there were before with the introduction of all kinds of um, species from other parts of the globe. So, and, uh, and, and sometimes even you can imagine that this kind of increase in biodiversity, there were also, there was also an increase in kind of cultural diversity in the city. Um, and that there, there are kind of so many different ways of sort of um, gauging the kind of health and diversity of, um, of species, of culture. Um, and in a way, I think the, the project is trying to kind of tease apart some of those without really answering and kind of without having it kind of knowing like what, um, you know, do, do these need to be trade-offs or not? I think I'm trying to, to imagine, could the city change to in such a way that it both preserves the kind of diversity that it has um, today or over the past hundred years or so, while also kind of welcoming back um, the very species that the growth of the city kind of originally displaced. Um, so that's very local, but it's kind of necessarily tied to all of these larger global forces. I think climate change is becoming becoming one of those, but these things are just kind of enmeshed and entangled and they have relationships, but at the same time, sometimes it's helpful to look at things that are operating at different scales in order to it, sometimes almost define those connections. You have to first make those distinctions as a kind of conceptual model. To add something to that, I think uh, in the future, cities are gonna look more like maps of climate risk, like this, Past year at UCLA uh, in studio, we were looking at the different risks in Los Angeles, like liquefaction, uh, fire risk, flooding. And in a way, you can imagine that once some of these properties become uninsurable, like in uh, Bel Air that are on the front of fire risk, then uh, they won't be developed. People will move out. People will find a new place in the city. So in a way, you could imagine that uh, these new maps of climate risk might play a role in the future with land use of where uh, settlements are created and where people move um, later on. So these real estate values could, in the future, yeah, show some of that climate risk. Uh, Michael Wang, Nick Litzko, and Julian Schaefer, thank you very, very much for your time. This was wonderful. We all appreciate your wisdom. Um, and we appreciate everyone tuning in with us live on YouTube tonight. Uh, this may not be the most significant uh, climate event that you view this evening at uh, 9 p.m. Central or Eastern time, excuse me. Um, we'll have our first uh, presidential debate post primary for our American view voting viewers um so and we'll listen keenly to how these politicians respond to science um if it can at all compare to that of our of our panelists uh so again michael wang julian schaefer nick let's go thank you very much for being here we really appreciate it oh, thanks for having me <laughs>